Yes, this house which I have built. You understand then how great God is. Immense, large, big, mighty, indescribable. We're looking at Psalm 47. Psalm 47. I want you to think about this, that this is the God who is your father. This is the God who is your redeemer. This is the God who loves you so much and essentially sent you begotten son Jesus Christ. And he says, I want you to live with me. I want to be your father. I want to take care of you. And he's so great, he's so mighty, and the heaven of heavens cannot contain him. And yet he says he wants to have relationship, father-child relationship with you. What a great thing is this, a great privilege is this, that the God of heaven, the mighty God of heaven, as immense, as great, as big, as everlasting, as eternal, as infinite as he is, he wants to be your father. And he says, what can you give? for this? What exchange will you make for this? That you just abandon your sin and say, this is a great privilege. Let me ask you, if you rich man, the richest man in your country, the richest man in your community, if he just came to you and said, I, I want to be your father and I want to take care of you and I want to take care of every need in your life and you've read about him, you know about him and People have sung about him. People have written about him. And he's so great and he's so mighty. And now he comes to you and he says, I want to be your father. I want to take care of you. What a great privilege that will be. Then he says, only one condition. Live where you are and come unto me. You hurry up and pack all your load and live where you are. And then you come to him. And now the God of heaven is greater than any man, greater than any king, and greater than any emperor on earth. He comes to you and he says, I want to be your father. All you need to do is vacate where you are. Live where you are. Abandon where you are. That you is live all your sin. And then come in repentance and come to the Lord. And he says, now once you do that and you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I'll save you. Take all your sins away. And then I become your father. What a great privilege. That man will be a fool to reject such a great privilege. That woman will be a grateful, the greatest fool on earth to reject such a privilege. Village, our God is great, and this great God is our Father. He'll be your Father. In uh, in Psalm 47, I'm reading from verse two. For the Lord Most High is terrible; He is, he is a great King over all the earth. As we read about this, always remember we're talking about God. It's not just a God that is far away and it's a loop over there. We cannot even touch him or relate with him. It's a God who has covenanted to become our father. And he says this God is the most high. And it's terrible, terrible against the enemy and terrible against the pagans and the heathen. He is a great king over all the earth. In verse 7 it says, For God is the king of all the earth. Sing ye praises with understanding. God reigneth over the heathen. God seated upon the throne of his holiness. As we think about that, he's inviting, he says, hey, why is he describing himself to you? He's describing himself so that you'll see what you miss when you are not with God. And you'll see what you gain, what you have, what you possess when you come to the Lord. You'll see what you lose when you backslide and you go away from this great God. What sorrow, what disappointment, and what suffering you are going to have if you forsake such a God like this. But if you stay with this God, the God of all the earth, the King of all the earth, the one that has dominion from everlasting to everlasting and from generation to generation, if you stay with such a God, what a great benefit is yours. What a great inheritance is yours. In verse 9, the princes of the people are gathered together, even the people of the God of Abraham, for the shields of the earth belong unto God. Think about that. That all the protection you can have in the world, everything is controlled by our Heavenly Father, by this great God of heaven and earth. He is greatly exalted. We're looking at Psalm 83. In Psalm 83, I'm reading from verse 18. Psalm 83, verse 18. That men may know that thou, whose name alone is Jehovah, 
arch the most high over all the earth that men may know. Do you remember what Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar? Uh, Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar that this will come upon you. This tree will be cut down. And then seven seas will pass over the tree. Telling Nebuchadnezzar, thou art the man. You are that tree. You'll be deposed, you'll be dethroned, you'll be sent away from your throne. And you will eat grass like animal. And the dew of heaven will come all over you. And then you, your fingernails will grow like the claws of the beast of the animal. And then the air of your hair will grow like the feathers of the eagle until you know that the Most High dwelleth in heaven and he liveth forever and ever and he ruleth over all kingdoms until you know that. Now think about that. Nebuchadnezzar has to go through those years, seven years of humiliation, seven years away from the throne, seven years of suffering before he could know that the most high rulers in the kingdoms of men. But now you don't have to go through that. See what has happened that God now has preserved that knowledge for you. And now he puts it almost like on a silver plate and he says, Nebuchadnezzar has known it, other people have known it, and the reason why this is recorded is so that all, all people may know that this God is the most high. And the reason why you came to the Bible study tonight is so that you will know. Just sitting down, just listening to the word of God and receiving it in your heart that now you say, I know, I know what Nebuchadnezzar knew. And I don't have to go through all those sorrowful experiences of Nebuchadnezzar before I know that. But searching that men may know that thou whose name alone is Jehovah at the most high over all the earth. We're looking at Psalm 92 verse 5. Psalm 92, we're reading from verse 5. O Lord, how great are thy works, and thy thoughts are very deep. O Lord, how great are thy works, and it says, thy Thoughts are very deep. A British man knoweth not, neither does a fool understand this. When the wicked spring as the grass, and when all the workers of iniquity do flourish, it is that they shall be destroyed forever. But thou, Lord, art most high forevermore. That's what gave confidence to the psalmist. Remember David? He faced giants. He faced difficulties, he faced problems, he faced Goliath, he faced Saul, he faced what other people had never faced. What kept, him what kept him going on? What made him to keep on standing? What made him to be steadfast? What made him to be able to say, you come to me with the shield and with the sword, and you come to me in the name of your idol, but I come unto you in the name of the Lord Most High of the God of heaven, whom you have defied. It's because he knew that God is a great God. He knew the immensity of God. He knew the greatness of God. That's what gave him boldness. That's why he said, I will run through a truth. That's why he said, I will tread upon the heads of my enemies. That's why he said, I will enter into his pavilion. He will hide me in his pavilion. He knew the greatness of God. You know, the people that try, they come to worship and they go to church and they do this and that. And if a little problem comes and then they are panicking and they are trembling and they are afraid. As if, how will I face this? They don't know how great the Heavenly Father is. They don't know how great their Redeemer is. They don't know how great the power, the immensity of the power, the might of the, of the Almighty God. They do not know that. It is, that's the reason we're studying. So that when you know how great your God is, then your confidence will be able to say, I know who my God is. I know his power. I know his strength. I know his might. And I know the possibilities that I have in him because I belong unto him. In verse 8, but thou, Lord, art most high forever, forevermore. We're looking at Psalm 145, Psalm 145, verse 13. 145, verse 13. Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And you see, if you look at the title of that, that's the Psalm of David. David's Psalm of Praise. David knew this many, many years before. 
How did he know that? God revealed it unto him. He didn't have to go through suffering, humiliation, being deposed, being dethroned. You know, there are many ways of learning a lesson. You can learn a lesson in a very simple way. Sit down, hear it, accept it, assimilate it, digest it, think it over, and apply it to your life and say, Praise the Lord, I've got that knowledge. Other people, they wait until they're dethroned. They wait until they're caught down. They wait until they are chastised. They wait until a calamity comes upon them. And now they learn what they could have learned sitting down. And as we learn this today, I pray it will sink deep into our hearts. That we will know like David knew. Like we will know like eventually this man, the Cadnison knew. The Lord, the, thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. I was looking at uh, Psalm 90, verse 2. Psalm 90, we was looking at verse 2. In Psalm 90, verse 2, I will see what the Lord is preserving for us here. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. This God is great. And I pray that you'll know him by personal experience in Jesus' name. God is referred to as the Most High. You find that all over Daniel. The supremacy of the Most High God includes his omnipotence. That means he's all-powerful. His omnipresence. That means there's nothing you can hide from him because he's everywhere present at the same time. And he's omniscience. And that means that he knows all things. The full revelation of the attributes of God makes us know that he is the first and the last. He changes not. He shall endure even when the earth and the heavens have all passed away. Now you see Nebuchadnezzar in his newly received revelation and personal conviction. Nebuchadnezzar recognized that God is the God of heaven. Come back to Daniel chapter 4 and see the last verse in chapter 4 and see what he said about this God. He says, now, he said, I'm not the same person I used to be. I'm not as ignorant as I used to be. And I'm not as wicked as I used to be. A conversion has taken place. A transformation has taken place. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the God of heaven. The God of heaven. Whose all, whose works are truth. And all his ways, judgment. You see, he knew now the divine sovereignty of the Almighty God, that he rules over all of heaven and all of earth. He had a clear recognition of the righteousness of God's dealings with him. He praised God as the king. And he says, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment. He had learned and known that God is the one who truthfully observing all that takes place on earth and above all possibility of deception, applies a just and equal test to every man's conduct and appoints for him what is right. Nebuchadnezzar magnified the power of God and commended the justice of God. Listen to this. His humiliation and affliction became his schoolmaster and taught him eternally valuable lessons which neither prophets nor angels could teach him. If a prophet had come to him and had said, we're going to have a class today, we're going to have a Bible study today, Nebuchadnezzar, and we're going to talk about the greatness of God, the power of God, the might of God, the immensity of God. Even Daniel could have taught him that, he wouldn't learn. An angel could have come from heaven to teach him that he wouldn't learn it until suffering, chastisement, punishment, humiliation became his schoolmaster. And when he came out of that school, he said, I've learned my lesson. Now I know who God is. He is the most high. He is the mighty one. He is the king of heaven. And his kingdom is everlasting. His dominion from generation to generation. I pray we'll learn the same lesson. We come to point number two now. 
the insignificance of man. And there's something that the Kadnezza realized. He learned another lesson. He had learned his lesson about God. Now he learns a, le a lesson about man. He, used, he was thinking before that man was great. In fact, he felt he was greater than the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. That's why he told Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he said, I hear that you are not worshipping my idol. Now, if you will hear the sound of the music, and then you fall down to worship, well, but if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? In the days of his pride, of his haughtiness, of his ignorance, that's what he thought. He thought he was greater than God. That what he decides to do, to throw Shadrach, Meshach, and then he go into the fire. Where is the God that will deliver you out of my hand? He thought he was all in all. He thought man was a great, great personality. He thought man had a decision and could do anything that he wanted to do. And not even the God that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego believed in could change or turn that around. He thought that his decision was final and his project was final. His program was final. And whatever he wanted to do, he thought it was all in all. But now he had learned a lesson. What lesson did he learn? He, he learned that man is nothing. In the sight of the Almighty God, he learns that man is lighter than vanity. Look at it in um, Daniel chapter 4, verse 35, the first part. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. Nebuchadnezzar had an extraordinary discovery of the nothingness of mankind. Not just of the nothingness of one man, not just the nothingness of Nicodemusa, but all the inhabitants of the earth. It says they are nothing. That means he discovered the nothingness of the whole of mankind. I want you to look at um, Isaiah chapter 40. In Isaiah chapter 40, we're reading verse 15. Isaiah chapter 40. Verse 15, Nebuchadnezzar, you don't need to go through all this harrowing experience, sorrowful experience, a terrible experience of being deposed and going into the forest and then going through all that kind of thing before you learn this lesson. If you had just turned to Isaiah, you would have learned that long, long ago. And the lessons we need to learn in our lives, many times, we don't need to go through this terrible experience of suffering. Before we learn all these lessons, if we just turn to the Word of God, the lessons are there already. But many people, they wait until that kind of terrible experience of Nebuchadnezzar comes upon them before they learn the lesson that they ought to learn. Now, I said, chapter 40, I'm reading from verse 15. It says, Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket. What does that mean? The nations, all the nations together, they are as a drop of a bucket. You know, if you draw water from the, from the well, you take a bucket to the well, you dip it inside, and then you bring it out. As you bring that bucket out, you find some drops of water dropping off from the side of that bucket. You don't worry about that because they're insignificant. They're inconsiderable. That's what he's saying. He's saying the nations are like drops of water like that falling from the bucket. Or turn it around, another illustration. You, you take water in a bucket and then you pour that water into a drum. And when you've done that, there are some drops that remain there. And then when you are put the bucket somewhere, the drops fall off. And he says, that's how small, how insignificant men and nations are. In verse, in verse 15, and it, behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket and are counted as the small dust of the balance. What does that mean? You know, there are times you might hang your clothes outside. You wash the clothes and then the wind is blowing. 
and then you have some uh, some stains of dust on that shirt. You cannot even see the dust because it's just invisible, insignificant. And it says like those invisible stains or drops or grains of sand upon a dress that you hang outside. That's how the inhabitants of the world are. They're nothing in comparison with the Almighty God. Uh, you understand sometimes if you have flown in an aeroplane while you're still on the ground and you look out through the window, it appears that those men are big and, and those cars and all those houses are very big. And then the aeroplane takes up and goes up and up and then it goes up so much but at the time you look down, the men that look very big, now they're very small. They're like a little, little hands insignificant. And you say that is how men are. Look at me, sir. You could have learned that long time ago without going through that kind of experience. You know what the Lord is telling us? Don't wait until the rod of chastisement comes upon you before you learn what you should learn. Yeah, but you know, if you don't learn it easy, you learn it the hard way. Because if God wants to teach you a lesson, He'll teach you no matter how long it takes. It might take seven years, but you learn it. But then that's not the best way to learn. Why don't you take the easy way and just go back to Isaiah and go back to the Psalms and go back to the apostles and learn the word of God and understand that this is the pre this is preserved for you in the word that you will learn. Look at verse 15 again. Behold, in the latter part, he takes up the isles as a very little thing. The isles, the islands, he takes them as a very little thing in verse 17. And all the nations before him as nothing. You can listen, did you hear that? All the nations before him are as nothing. And then you can listen, waited seven years before he realized that all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. Then it says in that verse 17, and they are counted to him less than nothing and vanity. We're looking at verse 22 of that same chapter, verse 22. It is he that seated upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers that stretches out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. Verse 23 that bringeth the princes to nothing. He brought Nebuchadnezzar to nothing, and now Nebuchadnezzar confessed that all the inhabitants of the earth. The kings and the princes included, there is nothing. He bringeth the princes to nothing. He maketh the judges of the earth as vanity.